I heard there's a Super Bowl going on today. Well, you know, New England's going to get crushed because they're really not patriots. They're dwellers. <laughs> they're pretenders. But anyways, <laughs> you know, there's a difference between dwellers and patriots, right? Praise God. <laughs> oh, glory. Grab your swords. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. God is good all the time. <laughs> I want to go to the book of Revelation. Woohoo. Mm. And uh, Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Hallelujah. Is everybody there? Let's speak it together. Now I saw a new heaven and a what? A new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. For those who are fear of water. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He said to me, Write, for these words are true and what? Faithful. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give her the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, the what? The cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immorals, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. In other words, those were dwellers. They were not patriots. You're a patriot of the kingdom of God, or you're just a dweller. Amen. Amen? Now, I want you to grab hold of something here because this is important. What you just heard, you can see. And in this, this is called the promised land. Does everybody get it? Amen. This is the promised land. Amen. This is the hope. This is what you and I are living for. To make it home. This will be your home. This is the promised land that was promised to you as you became a believer and a follower. Amen? There are many people who say they believe, but they don't follow. Amen. Those are the difference between patriots and dwellers. There's a difference. And in this promised land, there is a process to access this promised land. Oh, glory. Glory. But this is your hope. This is what you thrive for to make it home. And you want to bring as many people into the kingdom as possible because this is glorious. This is eternity. This is everything. This is what Jesus prepared for all of us. A new kingdom, a new realm. There'll be no more earth. It'll be different. It'll be bigger. Because it's going to have to hold the city. You're talking about a city that's 1,500 miles tall, 1,500 miles wide, and so forth. But it's bigger, larger, holds everyone. The whole earth will be dwelled. It will be maintained by the glory of God and the presence of God. There will be no more evil. No more, there won't be night and day. The light of God's presence will be the light. 
There'll be a river that will flow from the throne room of God. There'll be trees that you and I will eat from that will bring life and maintain life. Everything will be different. We can't even comprehend it because of our peanut brains. It's tough. Amen. But it all started when God chose and predestined, died for us before the foundations of the world, and came himself to make a way. Can you imagine God Almighty who created all things, who knows all, been there, done it, <laughs> said, listen, I'm going to come as a man to show you the way. And I'm going to die for you. I'm going to make flesh out of my word. I'm going to make my own blood, which is pure. And I'm going to shed this own blood. I'm going to let the powers of darkness kill me. And then I'm going to rise from the dead. And I'm going to go kick butt first in hell. I'm going to re release everyone that's been captive who's been willing to follow me. See, the ones not willing to follow him, even though they might have believed him, chose to stay. And that's still happening now. Turn to Ezekiel 36. The promised land. Verse 22. Ezekiel 36, verse 22. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody there, let's speak it. Therefore say, say to the house of Israel, you know when God speaks to Israel, you know he speaks to us too. Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God. When I am hallowed, when I am reverenced, when I am feared in you before their eyes. When I am recognized, when you live for me, and others will know that you live for me. For I will take you from among the what? Nations. This is national ethics also. All people's nations. And I'll bring you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Listen, you are in the land right now that was predestined and promised for you. Amen. Every one of us here is an immig immigrant, although we did it the right way. Amen. My parents paid the price. And they did it the right way. Does everybody get it? And because of that, we are now our citizens of the predestined promised land of God. Does everybody understand? Amen. Now look at in this promised land, he says uh, there's something he's going to do. He says, I'm going to predestine you for this land. He said in verse 25, and then I will what? Sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be what? Clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. And I will give you a what? A new heart. So he's going to cleanse you. Right? He's going to place you in this new land. And then he's going to break all the stuff off and expose all your idols. And everything that's been between you and him so he can be number one in your life. And then he will give you a what? A new heart. And will put a new spirit within you. And I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments to do them. Then you shall dwell in the what? Land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. And I will deliver you from all of your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and multiply it. And I will bring no famine upon you. I will multiply the fruit of your trees and increase your fields so that you need never again bear the reproach of famine among the what? Among the nations. Wow. Then you shall remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loaf yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. 
Not for your sake do I do this, says the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Powerful. In other words, he's going to give you a new heart. He's going to give you a, a new spirit so that you are born again. And then he's going to put your, his spirit in you to cause you to want a desire for his counsel, his protection, and his direction in where? In the new promised land that he's given you right here. Now, our forefathers have come here. And in this promised land, so you and I were a part of our lineage that our forefathers came. But even though that you were in a promised land, see, there's two types of promised lands. There, there's a physical promised land and a spiritual promised land. Does everybody get it? There's a, a, a also... In the promised land, there's a promised land of God and there's a land of deception. Many people live in the land of deception. So you're either living in the land of deception, even though it's called the promised land, but it's not the promised land of God. There's a promised land that's been directed by God. One land is deception and the other land is truth. Land, what depends what land you're living in. Now, it rains on both sides. Does everybody get it? There's, there's blessings on both sides. There's prosperity. There's all kinds of things. Some people don't realize that they're living on the land of deception, thinking that they're real living on the promised land. And that's what deception does to people. It causes them to stay in the land of deception but not live in the promised land. Because only by living in the promised land can you make it to the eternal promised land. Is everybody okay? And Numbers 14. Numbers 14 and verse 20. The promised land. Oh, glory. Verse 20. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice. They certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me, what? Fully, I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley tomorrow and move out into the what? Into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Look at God has set a death sentence here. <laughs> On the what? Rebellious. We know that Joshua and Caleb were the only ones out of millions that were, that were taken out of Egypt, which is the representation of the land of bondage, who made it from the original. They were the only original from the time of the accident of Egypt, known as the house of bondage, who made it to the promised land. Why? Because the rest of them were rebellious. Does everybody get it? In other words, God was bringing them through. You know, one of the things that I've always seen is the Lord, he's creating a tested citizenship for eternity. So there are qualifications that you must follow. In other words, your time here is going to reflect your time there. What you do here is going to affect what you do there. Amen? Is everybody okay? And Genesis 12.
Genesis 12. First three verses. Now the Lord said to Abram, who became Abraham, get out of your what? Your country. From your what? From your family. And from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. And I will make your name great. And I will, and, and you shall be a what? Blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be what? Shall be blessed. Abram or Abraham was given the command to get out of his country, from his family to another land of dwelling and expand the family, the family of followers. And bless, and he was going to bless the family and the land. That's why Israel is blessed. Those who bless Israel shall be blessed. Those who curse Israel shall be cursed. <laughs> no, you know, no wonder why the devil hates Israel, Jews, and Americans, and Christians. Hello, because we're blessed. We are of the seed of Abraham. And we are in the land that God has promised. This is where you and I live. This is what he's promised. And in this, he said, it will be a place flowing with milk and honey. Locusts and honey too, right? All kinds of blessings, all kinds of opportunities. Nothing is impossible. You know, when we begin to look back in our all and how we've spent our days prior to finally knowing the truth and wasted time. We don't want to waste no more time. Amen? Because we want time to work for us, not against us. In Hebrews chapter 11, out of the families, out of everything, into a kingdom family. So you are now patriots as citizenships of eternal life. Amen? The kingdom of God. Not dwellers. <laughs> Verse 8, Hebrews 11, 8. What does it say? It says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, and heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's the eternal promised land city. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful and who had what? Promised. Therefore, from one man and him as a good as dead were born as many of the stars of the sky in a multitude, innumerable as of the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not receiving the promises, but seeing them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a what? Heavenly country. The final promised land. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And that is the city that we just spoke about in Revelation chapter 21. By faith, that means Abraham trusted in God and his promises by faith. He left all to dwell in the land of promise, the promised land, awaiting the promised city from above. 
There are two lands. There's the land of promise again, and there's the land of deception. Both have benefits, opportunities, governments, citizens, religions, religious beliefs, families, economy. They have hopes, disappointments. They have doctrines. They have rules and rulers. They have laws. They have regulations. They have education and military. They have doctors and so forth. But one is a promised land, and one is a land of deception because even though it rains on the wicked and the righteous it, the land of deception will come to an end with its citizens also but the land of promise or the promised land and its citizens will continue forever by entering the eternal realm of promise from god almighty and this is what's happening right now people are actually even there are people who are proclaiming to be believers are dwelling in the land of deception because they're not followers. They say they believe in Jesus, but they don't even read the word. They don't believe in the word of God. And a person that doesn't believe the word of God is a dweller, not a citizen. It's different. Is everybody okay? Amen. Romans 9. Many slip from the promised land into the deception land. Remember, the enemy's always trying to draw people out of God's promises and into deception. In Romans chapter 9. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's one of the things the enemy is fighting for is to keep you in the land of deception. The land of lust. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life. One day all this will be gone. Hallelujah. In verse 1, let's speak it. I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, and the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who was over all, the eternal blessed God. Amen. You know, Paul was grieved because his countrymen still didn't believe in Jesus. They missed the Messiah. Verse 6, But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who say they are, are of Israel, nor are they children because they say they are, they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. So those who dwell in the land of deception are children of the flesh. But the children of the promise are counted as the what? The seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him who what? Who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. And it is written, Jacob I have loved, but what? Esau I have hated. Isaac was a seed promise of Jacob. I mean, Isaac was a seed promise. Jacob was a seed promise. Is everybody going to understand? Until Jesus Christ came, the only true seed promise. Remember, Esau sold his birthright for fleshly. For desire, for false satisfaction. And Ishmael was born out of season. There was a forced birth. Ishmael was not of the lineage who was supposed to come from Sarah, but came from her servant. Amen? Amen. These were known as children of the flesh and the land of deception. But we are to be called the children of the seed in the promised land. There's a difference. 
But the enemy wants to steal your seed, you know. He wants you to sell your birthright. He wants you to give up everything in the promised land and bring you back into the land of deception. But God has given us a free will. The word says those who willfully, willfully choose, willfully disobey, there is no more covering for them. Willfully sin, there is no more covering. Go to Hebrews. We're going to go there for a minute so we can get this covered. Hebrew. Hebrew chapter or something. Let's see here. Chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26. Hallelujah. It's not that man can be taken out of the hand of God. It's that man walks out of the hand of God. Does everybody get it? In verse 26, what does it say? For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, does that mean they've been saved already? Yeah. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. In other words, there's no more covering. They're open. But a certain fearful expectation of what? Judgment. And fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he has sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? I would say he's going to cook. That person has left the promised land into the land of deception. And he is now a dweller, no longer a patriot. Does everybody get it? Oh, hallelujah. Galatians chapter 3. Again, many slip from the promised land into the deception land. Remember, there is prosperity on both lands. Amen? There's success in both lands. It rains on both lands. The rain don't change. Galatians chapter 3. Why are we hearing this now? Why is the Holy Spirit releasing this now? I really believe it's an area of reality. He's always trying to bring reality to us. He's always trying to keep us sensitive and discerning. Why? Because Satan's greatest weapon is deception and his power is fear. He doesn't want us to get caught up chasing money. He doesn't want us to get caught up chasing materialism. He doesn't want us to... There, and there's nothing wrong with having it. Don't get me wrong. But when it becomes people's gods and their idols, it becomes wrong. People are more interested in building their empire than they're expanding the kingdom of God. We're to be living for him. Our hearts should be what he wants, not what we want. But he loves us. He loves when we're prosperous. Why? Because the word tells us to be prosperous. Why? So we can help those who are in need. I'm going to put 500 billboards in every state declaring Christ. Through the whole country. Whoa. I'm going to need some lots of cash for that. That's my desire. I want to tell everybody about Jesus. We all have a story to tell. Everyone has a story and a testimony to tell what Jesus has done in our life. And we need to get it out. But the enemy is trying to stop it. He's doing everything that he can. Oh, yes. Galatians 3.15. Brethren, I want speak in manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet it is, if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. 
Now to Abraham and what? His seed were the promises made. He does not say and to seeds or as of many, but as of one. And to your seed who is what? Christ. So you have the seed of Christ in you. This is where people, you know, and it's, it's terminology, you know. There's a difference between being saved and born again. Does everybody get it? Because when you are born again, it's totally different, man. People can accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and the seed is there. And they may be saved and they're living in the outer court of the tabernacle. But there's another place that we call born again. He who is in Christ, that means the anointing. That is the second baptism. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit which causes birth to that seed where his character now possesses you. That is born again. Now, people can call from... Now, that's a state of being. Is everybody with me? You can fall from the born-again state of being back into a saved state. But I can tell you, when you go fall back into that saved state, the next state is out of state. <laughs> Hallelujah. Remember, everything revolves around the tabernacle. There's three chambers. The outer court, holy place, and most holy place. That should be visualization to you all the time. What state of being are you in today? Amen? Amen. First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3 and verse 4. Everybody there? Let's speak it. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in Jesus there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. That's, say it again. Whoever abides in him doesn't sin. It doesn't mean that you won't be tempted. It doesn't mean you won't make a mistake, but you will not let sin dwell. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, and his seed does what? It remains in him. Now, does that mean the seed can be stolen? Yes, you give it away. You give that seed away, just like Esau, who sold his birthright, gives it away. But he cannot sin because he has been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is a message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain who was the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were what? Right. Righteous. We know that we have passed from death to life. No, do not marvel by by my brethren don't do not marvel my brethren if the world hates you they're going to hate you if you've noticed look at how much hatred is in the political arena right now look at how much hatred is against this president i want you to grab hold of something that there was a 16 year plan to bring down this country <laughs> eight years of obama and eight years of clinton that was their plan There was no way Trump could have won without divine intervention. That's why they hate him. Incredible hatred for him. Because God chose a man not common to the political arena or the governmental arena and put him in office to stir him up, expose him so God can cut him off. And it's happening right now. And we're a part of it. And the people that don't see it are dwellers. Because they're not patriots. Only patriots see what's going on. Amen. Dwellers will not see it because God hasn't given them the eyes to see. Because their hearts aren't connected to his. Amen. But when your heart's connected to his, he gives you eyes to see and ears to hear. It's different now. Everything is different. 
glory. Woohoo! Oh, snap. <laughs> yes. Yes, verse 14. We know that we have passed from what? Death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brethren abides in death. Woo. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Only by maintaining the seed of promise will allow me and you an entrance to the eternal promised land. Acts chapter 1. Oh, yes. <laughs> Acts chapter 1. Is everybody there? In verse 4. And being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them, everyone say command, Amen. not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the what? Promise. The promise, another promise. We got promised land. Now, this is powerful because what he was attempting to do was release the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit to individuals so they can access the promised land of the second chamber of the tabernacle of God. Uh, grab hold of this here. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they heard, they, uh, when, therefore, when they had come together, they asked Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He wasn't talking about the kingdom of Israel. He's talking about the kingdom of God. And he said, Then it's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive what? Power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be what? Witnesses. Witnesses. To me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What was he talking about? He's talking about the promise of the Father to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, which puts you into the promised land of the second chamber of the tabernacle of God. Do you understand? You don't access that chamber without the baptism. Other than that, you live in the outer court. But we want to live in the holy place. That's why he's called Holy Spirit. You can't get in there without the Holy Spirit. Or you'll live in the outer court. Oh, glory. Go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Why? Because that gives you a state of being a born again. Verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent! And let every one of you become baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sins. Okay, cool. Repent, get baptized, that's cool. That's water baptism. It's symbolic anyways. And you don't have to be baptized in water to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because I wasn't. I got baptized by the Holy Spirit. Then I got baptized in water. That's just religious garbage. In fact... If you never got baptized in water, it doesn't keep you from going to heaven. Amen. The baptism of water represents the washing of the blood. That's what cleanses. <laughs> and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's the second baptism. Amen? That's another baptism where you get speaking tongues, where you have power, where you become a witness, <laughs> where that seed is birthed and the character of Christ is manifested through you. Well, you think differently, you see differently, you hear differently. You see through the natural realm into the spirit realm. You discern what's pushing you. You discern what's leading you. You discern deception because you have discernment now. Things are different. The gifts are manifested in you. The gifts of the spirit. You cast out devils. You lay hands on sick. You drive out demonic forces. You cleanse your own house out. You can discern what's an accursed item and what's not a cursed item. Amen. 
You know what pleases God and displeases God. And it puts you in a place of priesthood where you are a minister to the Lord. Not just a dweller. Amen? Amen. Oh, glory. Again, there's still many believers, supposedly believers, that are living in the outer court. No power. They're in the outer court. And some of them have been baptized in the Holy Ghost and are still living in the outer court. Because they choose that way. They choose that life. And the next thing, the closest thing to the outer court is hell. The outer darkness. That's why we're to be living into the promised land in the second chamber of the tabernacle of God and dwelling into the third chamber, waiting for eternal. But we are already eternal citizens right now. Oh, grab hold of this. 1 Peter chapter 2. I know a lot of dwellers. I don't hang with them, though. I don't have friends. I have brothers and sisters. In the kingdom of God, they're brothers and sisters. Because friends will betray you. Until they're unplugged. In fact, it's still until they're unplugged from the outer court. <laughs> it still makes it a little bit difficult. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. 1 Pete chapter 2, verse 9. Let's speak it. But you are what? A chosen generation. I want royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Ooh. But who have not what? Obtained the mercy. But now you've obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Listen, you won't hear one good thing about Trump from the main street media. You won't hear one good thing. It's very difficult. Because they're dwellers. They're not patriots. Does everybody get it? Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as a supreme, or to governors, or as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of those who that do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of the foolish. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as what? Bond servants of what? God. Everybody wants to be a bond servant of God. Listen, living in the chamber. No, so you and I want to be second chamber patriots. Amen? Amen? <laughs> we are a royal priesthood. We are filled with the Holy Spirit, and we express the character of Christ. That's who we are. Those who are in Christ is a new creation. Old things pass away. All things are becoming new. But it's a matter, remember, it goes right back to the beginning. Why did they not enter the true promised land? Because of what? Disobedience. Amen? You can't call yourself a believer if you are not a follower. You can't call yourself a believer if you don't read the word of God, of promise, and know the covenant. Then you're just a dweller. There's a difference. And you can tell them by their fruit. Because they still have carnal, human, character, lustful, desires, disobedience, rebellious towards the things of God. Selfish. It's all about me. Amen? It's that selfie generation that we've come into these days. But God wants to break all that and bring people into the eternal generation. Life, a generation of life-giving not life-sucking. Romans 8. Oh, did I finish, Peter? Good. <laughs> Romans 8, verse 1. Romans 8, verse 1. Glory. Let's read it. 
There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who do not walk according to the what? Flesh. So is there condemnation to those who are walking according to the flesh? Yes, this is where by being filled and led by the Spirit is vital. Because this is what discerns whether you or determines whether you're a dweller or a patriot, whether you're walking in the promised land or the land of deception. Oh, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled. So there's a requirement to fulfill the law in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but a what? According to the spirit. So to fulfill it, you must walk according to the spirit. That means you must be led by the spirit who are the sons and daughters of God. Yes. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh because they're in the land of living in the land of deception. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So those who are dwellers cannot please God. Amen? Amen? Second Pete chapter one. The promised land. That is your hope. <laughs> That's what you fight for. And you try to bring as many people home. Jesus gave us a formula. <laughs> Deny yourself, pick up the cross and follow. Remember, when you pick up the cross, it's pulling the sword out. It's a battle, fight. You can't follow without a fight. You fight. Look at all of those who tried to follow Jesus. Even when Jesus was on the earth, there was always hindrances. Look at all the disciples, what happened to them. Cooked, hung upside down, tortured. All kinds of things. There was a battle. There was a fight to follow. Jesus said the narrow is, the path is what? Narrow and difficult. And not many go through that way. They'd rather go the wide way, the easy way. But that end is death and destruction. Because some people just aren't willing to deny themselves and call themselves believers. That's not a, that's not a believer. 2 Pete chapter 1 and verse 10. Let's speak it. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will what? Never stumble. And for, and for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. In other words, we need to be reminded. That's why he says, forsake not to assemble. You will hear many of these things, even though maybe a, a different arena of the message, but there's a repeat in a certain area of being remembrance to us. That there's deception is a killer. And the enemy, the devils and demons are real. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 13. Yes, I think it is right. As long as I am still in this tent <laughs> to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. So look at Jesus showed Paul, he was going home soon. He didn't know how, <laughs> but he knew he was going home soon. So he was preparing everyone. He was setting things in order. Listen, I, I think it's powerful that when you're close to the Lord, that you know when you're going home. I think there's an arena today. Uh, I mean, many of the great men and women of God, they knew, they had a sense that they were going home. I'm a, I know my departure is close. That's what they would say. Then I want to close it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1.
1 Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 26, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Let's speak it together. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. We ask again, Father, for your forgiveness, mercies, and grace to abound abundantly to us, knowing that the true promised land awaits us, even though we are in a temporary promised land. That, Lord, we may not fall into the arena of deception and fall in the land of deception to fall back as to just dwellers, but we want to be patriots to your kingdom soldiers and warriors, servants and priests, fulfilling our calling that we may be sons and daughters to please you all the days of our life. In Jesus' name. Anybody said amen?